Okay, so Verizon Data Bridge, in a, how many of you were in the, the opening remarks session this morning? I assume everybody. Great. I did try to set the scene this morning and I hope, you know, I can build upon it. And I want to make it interactive. I really appreciate you taking out, you know, an hour of your time to attend this session. My goal here today is in providing you a walkthrough of the Data Bridge Investigations Report, I'm only going to touch upon a number of key areas but I want to help you navigate the report when you go back to your desk, when you go back to day to day, your roles and responsibilities. What can I deliver to you as part of the, in, within the next hour, which makes you more impactful? That's my goal. If I, can uh, if I can lead you to one or two or maybe three actions, whether you're working on a risk, governance, compliance program, architecture program, some useful data point, then I think I've achieved my goal. Okay, that's my focus, right? Okay, so how many of you in the audience have are aware of BBIR report before today? Great. How many of you used it or applied it in your day-to-day -day scenario to, to get something meaningful out of it? Have you used the report for something? Okay, great. And okay, so quite a few are aware of the BBIR report and some of you, you know, this gentleman acknowledged he had used the report. It's very useful feedback for us because we've been doing this for 10 years. And uh, we continuously get feedback. And there's an email I'll provide you at the end. If there's any specific question you have, you can send it to the development team, and we'll be happy to respond to that in our next study. So I'm going to touch upon the, the, the data breach aspects, but I'm going to lead you to the scenarios from the field. As I mentioned this morning, you know, Verizon carried out over 500 investigations in 2015 across 40 countries. When we look at those scenarios, real investigations, right? What did we learn from it, right? So what we've done, we had to maintain the privacy, the confidentiality for our customers, right? So we've anonymized it. We've changed the names of the geographies, they, you know, where we did the investigation. We had to change the number of records because, you know, sometimes we're all human beings. We're all very smart, right? We can get to which threat scenario does that represent for it. So we, we have to change certain characteristics of the investigation, but we are sharing that, you know, with, with the global wide world. Something my legal team always wanted me to, uh, to put it on before I move forward. And, uh, okay, great. So all of these reports are available online. If you do a Google search, you can get a copy of not just this year, but the previous reports as well. Like you, you know, I have done, I work in various roles. I was, a, I, when I joined the security industry, you know, about 15 years ago, I, was, I worked in the engineering team. I worked as a defense accreditor. I worked as a security officer. I worked in professional services consulting. So my focus is pragmatic. You know, I'm one of you. How, what do we learn from this and apply to our scenario? Look at those because there are some great pieces of information which will assist you with your initiatives, right? And you know, the key point over here is whether you're doing a risk assessment, you all need some threat input, right? Whether you're developing a policy or a risk assessment, when you go to your, you know, to your executives, to your management team, for some kind of acknowledgement, endorsement, or approval, you can back up your statements with the references from this report. I, I speak to so many of our technology vendors as well who use this report to develop features functionality in the, in the technologies they develop, right? So there is some great anecdotal evidence available to you. You can use this, right? And I'm not gonna go touch upon each of those um, but you know there are members of the Verizon team here on the booth will be more than happy you know to have follow-up conversations but I'm going to focus on DBIR and DBD. So what is data breach investigations report? As, it, as the name itself says data breaches but the whole purpose is you know if I go back in the history um, in 2008 we thought Verizon has been doing forensics investigations since 2004. So in the year 2008, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we can anonymize all our you know, forensics investigations and develop a report? And in 2008, that's when we developed the first report. And our goal was, is very clear, 
understand the risks you face and prioritize your defenses, right? I know this is post-incident, you know, but something has already occurred. So it's after the incident has occurred. However, when you look at the data of the last 10 years, the top, I'll give you an example, top 20 threat actions have pretty much remained the same. What has changed is the order of it. Fishing in one year has moved to number 15, in the next year number five, and now staying in the top five. So we ask questions to ourselves, when you look at this report, what have we been doing on those top 20 threat actions, right? Because the, ha the, the bad threat actors continue to focus on those 20 you know, threat actions over the last decade. Obviously, the complexity, the scale has changed and so on. However, at the highest level, fishing, still a problem for the industry. They continue, it really makes them successful. In a, a year ago's report, uh, one of the conclusions we drew was, by the time a bad threat actor has sent three phishing emails to the targeted audience, they've captured 50% of their audience. That effective phishing is, and it's so easy, isn't it? Send emails, massive emails, and so on. So there are some various examples like those which the, the, the report provides you in detail. So we're focusing on, you know, in simplistic terms, who is doing what to whom, and what was the outcome? That's, that's the approach we are taking. And by understanding that, hopefully, we can derive what can we do to prevent from it. That's the goal here, right? Okay. These are the, the contributors, um, as I mentioned this morning. And I think it's very important. A, they are global. B, we have from law enforcement agencies to the ISACs to the uh, academia. We have Carnegie Mellon, who shares the security incidents uh, with us. Um, we have the US CERT, who shares with us. We have Cisco, FireEye, Symantec, you name it. All the technology, quite a few technologies share their security incident data with us. So when we carry out the research, and the analysis of those security incidents which we re receive on an annual basis, it provides us a much wider perspective, not just global, not just one specific uh, sector, but holistically. So it's very real, actionable data as part of this data science journey. So one key aspect, when we publish the report in, let's say, in 2016, this year's report, it's based on 2015's data. So we published the report in the second quarter of you know, of the year. And in the first quarter, we received the data from all these contributors. We analyzed, research, you know, and published the findings. So it's an annual cycle. The framework, various framework. Now, how, uh, let me ask a question. How many in the audience categorize incidents as part of their internal help desk or remedy system saying, this is the number of incidents associated with security. For example, you know, I'll give you an example. When a, uh, when, a, when a user notifies, oh, I cannot access internet, my network is running slow. We never think about that the, the user is experiencing a denial of service attack right, until you've done the root cause. How many of you categorize security incidents with some form of framework today? Any would like to share? One, two, okay, a few hands. Okay, Varys is, is a great framework, right? We've been using it for a decade, and I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, we share this with our customers. It's freely available. It's completely documented online, defining all the various types of metadata, how you can implement and you know, deploy across your enterprise. And we have some very, very large customers who are looking at it very, very closely as well in terms of deploying this as part of their incident response planning. It focuses on, at the highest level, four aspects. The first one is actor. Who's doing it? Is it external? Is it internal? Is it third party, you know, or some form of someone within the supply chain, right? And then what we've what we've done in this year's report is we we we're trying to share with the audience where we see some form of collusion between the two actors. So you can see where there is some form of a collaboration going on within the actors to care as part of a security incident. So understanding actor, who's doing it, number one. The second is the action. What makes the actor successful? Right. So the, some examples what I put there is malware, social engineering, hacking, and I mentioned top 20. There's a top 20 list in the report. And one way to use this is you can go back to your policy and say, pick one, act, you know, action, and say, what is it are we doing at the enterprise level in terms of policy, technology, or services deployed across, across your enterprise as part of the, the risk management cycle? 
So the second is the action. What action makes the threat actor successful? The third thing is the asset. What is it they're going after? What is it you have within your enterprise which the bad threat actor finds it very useful? Is it the web server? Is it the executive's laptop? Is it a user? Is it a web application server? Or, you know, for, you know, or so for universities, you know, the student enrollment data with the credit card number, what is it they, they're going after? Okay? So by understanding that, you can focus your efforts to protect those assets. At least first, you will look at those. Next one is the attribute. What are they interested in? Is it the confidentiality? Is it the integrity? Or is it the availability? So when you think about it for every incident, if you knew where the actor is coming from, what action they're taking to make, which makes them successful, what assets they're focusing on, and what attributes they're, they're interested in, it helps you to understand the complete end-to-end -end cycle for every security incident. What we've also done is that um, we map every security incident with NAICS code. North American Industry Classification Code. You can get a number for your enterprise online. Just do Google search. What is the NAICS code for company acts or public sector? It's, read, it's available online. And if you want to learn more, at the highest level, federal government publishes a code for every GDP generating enterprise across the United States. There's a code. It's about six or seven digit number. And what we do as part of our methodology I can just take the first two codes. So we can ask the question to our data repository, the big data we have, call it. Tell me how many security incidents occurred across public sector. The code for public sector starts with 92. The code for finance starts with 52, and I'll go into the details. So when you look at this framework, it's helping you to drill down on a vertical basis. Why? Because the threat landscape for public sector may be different to finance because the assets will be different, the motivations will be different, and so on. So by taking that approach of mapping it to the NAICS code gives you the granular perspective. So in this year's report again, we continue building upon it, right? And what we've also done, as I mentioned this morning, is we published the data breach digest. Taking the data breach report and supporting that with the, with the forensics investigations of the last three years. We've done that first time this year, we published that. So this is the framework. It, there's a various blog online. And it's, um, I think one of the things you meant is if you're, as far as you're not reselling products or services using that, it's fine. You can do, it's freely available online. So what was the scope for this year's report? How many incidents did we have? Uh, we had over 100,000 incidents. Actually, we had a lot more than that. But what we did, we had to take a few out where there was a secondary. Uh, so what I mean by that is, the, some assets were repurposed to carry out, to launch an attack with somebody else. So in order not to skew the data or so on, we had 100,000 incidents or confirmed 2,200 confirmed data breaches um, across 82 countries, just at the highest level. This is the scope of the data of this year's report. Now, in 2014, uh, for the first time, we were able to, we, we carried out further research and um, we were able to categorize almost over 95% of the data into nine incident patterns, right? The challenge we had two or three years ago, the feedback we used to receive is, you know what, there's so many assets across my enterprise. There's gonna be so many vulnerabilities, right? Okay, and how do I prioritize my focus? You have to understand the risk and prioritize the focus, right? And when we did the, the, the analysis of our data, what came out was almost 95% of the data can be put into these nine incident patterns. And what that means in simplistic terms is, okay, is we're not saying that you ignore the rest. However, it gives you a very defined focus of what matters the most for your enterprise, or at least for the, at the vertical level, based on the data we have. So I'll touch upon it as, as, as we go into details. So what you see on here is the incidents by sector. So what you see, for example, the, the bracket number 92 is the NAICS, the first two digits of the, the public sector code, right? And as we walk further, so there were just over 47,000 incidents across public sector. US CERT shared their security incident data with us. We, we thought from a risk perspective, the appetite is gonna be different. So if we could understand 
the types of organizations underneath that, it might be more meaningful. So what we did, small, large, and unknown. Small means organizations who had less than 1,000 employees. So how many security incidents, which we received from all these contributors, occurred in public sector, in organizations who had less than up to 1,000 employees? So now you're starting defining the, the profile of the organization, because the risk appetite might be different. Yeah? What matters to a smaller end organization might be different. For example, state agencies and federal agencies. Yeah, The threat actors are different, right? Then, for large, 1,000 or more employees. And where we don't know, we say unknown. We have to be very trans we, like, we like to be very transparent about our data. So where we don't know, we say we don't, we, it's unknown. So you see three categories over here. So I'll just walk you through public sector, just over 47,000 incidents, six in the small organizations, majority in the large organizations, and a couple of hundred in where we don't know. So it provides you. So how could you apply that? I've been a GRC professional. If you're doing risk assessment, if you want to define threat, right? What, you need some data, you need some evidence, right? A real actionable data. You could use the data and say, hey, within public sector, there were 47,000 incidents, or let's say if you're working for a large, just under 47,000 security incidents, and these were the top three incident patterns. So if you're working on acquisition of technology or an architecture refresh, it's gonna provide you some specific meaningful information from the report. What you see on my slides is a very small version or, a, or just a little extract from the actual report. The actual report is a couple of hundred pages, but hopefully by you know, the next hour will help you the navigation of the report easier when you go back. Focus on the threats to your industry, as I mentioned earlier. So when you look across public sector, so what you see on the slide there is the top is the nine incident patterns. Actually, there's 10. 10th is everything else. Where we don't know, we put it under everything else. So everything else is somewhere right here. Right? So where we don't know, we say everything, you know, under everything else. So when you look across this, <coughs> if you look up out of those just over 47,000 security incidents, and if we just look at the confirmed data breaches, so this is not just incidents. By the way, there's a clear definition of incident and a breach. Every incident, does not lead to a bridge, thank God. Otherwise, we'll have a very different challenge uh, for all ourselves. So what you see on the screen over here is there are, let's say, the top. For example, miscellaneous error, 37% of confirmed data breaches across public sector is a result of miscellaneous error. Miscellaneous error being a user sending an email to an incorrect distribution list. <laughs> very simple scenario. A user publishing a, um, a documentation outside the, the authorized domain. There are so many examples the report provides you, and these are the kinds of miscellaneous errors which leads to 37% of the confirmed data breaches within public sector in last year alone. So what is that, so how do you use this data? So you look at this thing, okay, what are we doing as part of our you know, information security program or a cybersecurity initiative to address this? Ask yourself the question based on your roles and responsibilities, and you can apply it effectively helps you understand the risk and prioritize your focus, your defenses. Because the, you know, I, the way I put, like to put it is, hackers are not magicians. This is helping you understand the hacker's playbook. If we understand the hacker's playbook, because they are going to go after the data, which they can carry out a compromise with the least amount of efforts, and if they're in for financial gain, how they can make a quick gain out of it. If we can, focus in, in such a way by which our ROI is better than theirs, they're gonna go away or focus on something else. How many of you use Shodan, the Google for hackers? I, I, uh, yeah. You go on Shodan, uh, you know, I don't recommend you use your work laptop, but Shodan is, a, is like a Google website and it provides you a lot of useful information to bad threat actors. You can ask them you know, simple questions and you can, you'll be amazed the amount of information gets delivered. And you know, it's fair to say, they probably use Shodan. And we've referred that in our last year's report as well. You know, with the advent of things like Shodan, hackers, have, they're very organized, very resourceful, very structured. And, and sometimes we wonder if there's a better communication between the, the hacker and the compromised user rather than the security team and the end user. Mm -hmm. It's just reality, you can, you can see that. So threat actor, we'll start with threat actor. 
So for the last, this, the sample over here is for the last five years, since 2010. You know, there's always that discussion, where is the threat coming from? Is it internal? Is it external? You know, is it the partner or is it some kind of collusion between the two? Um, and you can see the internal is pretty much staying, you know, at around 80% or thereabout. Pretty much staying, right? And pop, the rest, just not 20%. By the way, you might notice that the total is over 100%. So you might see the, the top line edge just going a little above 100%. Why? Because where there is collusion, we have to add one to both the threat actors, the, both the channels, right? And that's why the, the, the addition goes just a little over 100%. Because there's a small group of um, incidents where there's more than one threat actor. Motivation. You can see financial, um, espionage, pretty much, can, but I think the key one is 89% of the breaches had a financial or espionage motive. Why, why, what, what's the key motivation? Either they want to make money or they want to help enhance the national economy of another country. That's the motivation. So ask yourself the question, what is it you have within your enterprise which will help them be more successful, you know, with their objective here? And those are the kind of assets that might be a good starting point within as part of your security program. Actions over time. I mentioned, you know, the top 20 has pretty much remained the same. You can see here, hacking is on the rise. Malware is on the rise, right? You know, the report goes into much more detail. What we've seen, if you take the examples of the malware, is that, you know, the, the malicious codes have been written for targeted organizations. And they live for a very short duration of time. And what that means is, is that sometimes the anti when you know, virus or you know, anti-malware are not able to pick it up because they are specifically written for targeted organizations and which helps them to be more successful. The report goes into much more detail now for each of the action varieties. So for example, if you take malware, is it the command and control? Is it they using the stolen credentials? Uh, is it the export data? use of backdoor, see, it, it tries to provide you the granularity even for a specific threat action. I thought I'd just give you an example. The numbers over here is, is the number of, uh, you know, the actions it reaches over time for each of that. So a lot of data over here, but, you know, when you go back, pick your vertical, go to the specific incident pattern which applies to you, and then reuse it for your scenario. Asset types. And by the way, person is as a result of phishing, we use person over here. So you can see servers, yeah, you know, coming down or so on. User devices on the rise, you know. I think there's a lot been said about IoT. This year, we did not have any specific data with regards to IoT. We're not saying that that is not a focus area, but we are reliant on the data we receive. As we advance further, as we get more and more data associated with the mobile devices, hopefully we'll be able to provide you know, a better perspective on those areas as well. But not having the data doesn't mean it's not a focus area. That's not what we're saying here. But I just wanted to call that out just to share that with the audience. Right? Breach discovery over time, that's a key one. Fraud detection has gone down. And you see the, the internal, you know, ask yourself the question, the amount of investments you made internally across your technology platforms, and I work very closely with our, foreign, you know, our risk team, our forensics team. Very often, is a three-letter agency knocking on the doors of the customer and say, you have a problem, we have the evidence. That's the reality, right? The number of incidents detected by technology platforms is, is, is not huge still. And this is based on the caseload which we, which we analyzed this year, right? So you have to ask yourself the question is, the, the challenge for the industry, one of the conclusions from the report is improving the detection intensity. You might have the world best technology. You might have the, you know, the playbooks, the threat and intelligence platform, you're doing the correlation, all the great things, right? But we still need to be, you know, we need to be ahead of the threat actors working at the earlier stages of the kill chain. So having some form of use cases which helps you improve the detection intensity. Collecting the data doesn't go the long way, but you need to have threat intel sources and help you do you know, great things. One of the, the feedback we used to re uh, receive from our, uh, from the you know end users was, it's great you paint the portrait about what the threat landscape looks like, right? But you know ultimately quantify them dollar sign. So the first time in twenty fifth, the last year's report, we were able to analyze over one hundred and ninety plus cybersecurity insurance claims, actual claims submitted by enterprises who had compromises to, with, to insurance companies. 
So we had a we had a partner and who was able to provide the data, and we were able to conclude a cost per record. Okay, in this year's report, what we've done is this methodology perfect? No. Can we do better? Yes. But as we are on this journey, as we get more and more better data, we're about to share. So when we analyze the, the cyber insurance payouts um, this year, you can see the key area. So let me ask a question. How many in the audience have a, a, some form of a forensics retailer or an internal capability should you ever experience an unwanted activity? I hope not, but uh, you have one, two, show up, and three, and sh OK, great. Because I think one of the executive conclusions in our report is, it's a, as we all know, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when, right? And you're going to need some form, a retainer, you know, who can assist you. You may have internal capabilities, right? But what this, uh, this chart shows over here is the legal guidance and the forensics cost, the top two aspects of the cost, right? So even, um, I don't know if you have, how many of you have cybersecurity insurance? Okay, couple. Look at the scope. Use this data and see, does it cover these areas? Right? You'll be amazed of the scope um, you know, of what is included, what is excluded, and hopefully that will help you focus on what you should be considering going forward. A couple of data points with regards to phishing. Uh, nine, over 900 breaches as a result of phishing. So still a big problem. So out of those 2,260 breaches, which we confirmed this year, 900 involve phishing. You can ask yourself the question, you've probably done a lot of things across your enterprise, you know, training, awareness, technical tools, and so on. But still, it makes the bad threat actor successful. So it's still a focus area. And there's a lot of uh, valuable information available within the report with regards to, you know, percentage who open the phishing messages, how quickly they open it. And it's the, the median is 13 people even click on the attachment still. So, you, you know, the ex organizations who experienced a breach, 13% of those we're not only just clicking on the email, but also opening the attachment. So review your education awareness, see how comprehensive and robust it is. So this, this, this might assist you. <clears throat> One key point I would like to raise here, phishing data compromised. When the breaches do occur, it, the users, the, the bad threat actors, actually have the real credentials. And that is one of the challenge, why? Because we are unable to detect that some form of unwanted activity has been going on, right? It's the real credential. So everything is legitimate, a legitimate use. So bad threat actor has been able to steal the credential and carry out the compromise. And that makes it very challenging. But you can see over 829 breaches where credentials were stolen. So apply that to your own scenario. Do you have two-factor authentication, yeah. right? You know, how, you know, what is the scope of it across the enterprise? To what assets so on? Because that's a real cha um, challenge. Vulnerabilities. In the 2015 report, only 10 vulnerabilities were exploited in 96% of the incidents last year. N 10 vulnerabilities. Some went back to, you know, and what I mean by that is the CVE, the Common Vulnerability Exposure, was published over a year ago. So they had a year to address that vulnerability, right? And those 10 vulnerabilities are defined in the last year's report. This year, that number has gone down to 85%. So I think your, your uh, vulnerability management program is a little bit more effective, but still a very high number. Only 10 vulnerabilities were exploited in 85% of our caseload data. And if I look at the, uh, the remainder of 15%, there's about 900 vulnerabilities. So, you know, this makes the job of a bad threat actor, the hacker, so easy. They just know what vulnerabilities the users haven't focused on. And they're all documented. We're not saying that you ignore the rest. That might be a great starting point. In the last year's report, yes, sir? What percentage? Okay, so the question here is what percentage? So the over here is the 85%. So in 85%, is that those 10 vulnerabilities were not patched by the, the compromised organization. Right, but what I'm asking was, I know they weren't patched, that's how they were exploited, but were they already disclosed? And was a patch yeah, they, available? Yes, or were they 12 months. Known? 12 months. They had over 12 months to apply the patch. That's what I said. Right? So it's 12 months. And if you go back in last year, we've broken it down further, actually. By year, from 1999 to 2015, the most vulnerabilities, the, those top 10, were in 1997. They literally had over seven years to patch the system. 
and they're they're all defined by the the reference of the vulnerability as well in the report. I'd be happy to say, yeah. give you the data. Not to challenge this too much, but you know we all know we need to patch. Yes. It'd be more in interesting to know how do we protect after we've already patched. Yeah, but the, in this particular cases, they didn't even patch. I hope I've answered your question. Okay, I get the call here, a few minutes left here. So cyber espionage. So the report goes into a lot more details about each incident pattern, uh, looking at the number of breaches as a result of a specific threat action. So when you look at cyber espionage, how many across public sector? About 31. So it gives you that granular data which you can reuse. Um, again, within that threat action, what is it they're focusing on? In 88 cases, use of backdoor or command C2, right? Um, you look at social phishing, 68. So over 90% of the espionage bridges capture trade secrets or proprietary information. So, you know, one way of look, uh, interpreting this is, what assets do you have in your organization which is trade secrets uh, or proprietary, you know? And those might be the great, you know, a good starting point to focus. And this goes into details for each of the threat action. So I urge you, have a look at the report. If you wanted to have a deeper, you know, walkthrough, we're more than happy. Members of the Verizon team are here on the booth and so on. But we do this for, for any customers, and we, we, we do this for free, by the way, you know, and the team will be uh, happy to walk you through. But what, I, what this leads to is the conclusion, as I mentioned, is the detection deficit is highest on record. The industry average is over 200 mandates. It takes over 200 days before organizations identify that some form of unwanted activity has been occurring across the enterprise. What you see here, 84% on the screen there, is the detection deficit. Okay? Time to compromise versus time to discovery. A huge deficit. It's taking a very long time. The time it takes the, um, to carry out a compromise in public sector, in 76% of the cases, is seconds and minutes. And we have some uh, further data on our, on our uh, Verizon booth as well, which will give you that further explanation, decomposition of this chart further. Uh, this is just to give you a perspective. I mentioned the top 20 threat, you know, the, the, the 10 incident, nine incident patterns, last 10 years. So you can see the number of incidents and breaches per incident pattern over the last 10 year period. So I have a minute or so, and I just wanted to um, kind of touch upon the data breach digest, uh, which I mentioned uh, earlier on. But so these are the 18 threat scenarios which I mentioned earlier on, right? <laughs> We're using uh, US Army you know, enemy courses of action uh, methodology uh, as part of this analysis. So we've taken the six incident patterns from the DBIR report. We've taken our forensic caseload, the forensic files, and we've identified in 60% of the cases, we can attribute it to 12 threat scenarios. So the one which are not in bold, where 60% of the forensic investigations across the globe. Verizon does about uh, um, you know, I said in last three years, about just 1175 forensics investigations in 108 countries of the world, right? We've taken just the Verizon caseload data, and these are the threat scenarios. So there's a lot of commonality. And the one in, you know, bold highlighted are the lethality. So it's the frequency and the lethality we are focusing on. And I urge you, have a look at this. Um, for each of these threat scenarios, we're defining the characteristic of it. But the key aspect over here is we are mapping it to, to the countermeasure. What is it I need to do as an individual if a specific threat scenario is prevalent across my vertical? So you can go back and say, okay, CSC, critical security control. So you, you know, the critical security controls are available. We work very closely with the cyber security. You're familiar with SADS top 20 and so on. That info. So you can see data breach scenario, frequency 12%. What that means is, 12% of the breaches in the last three years can be attributed to the rotten apple. We've just given some names which, you know, which helps us to describe the threat scenario. What was the level of sophistication? Basic, low. What was the composition? Who were the, the, the people involved? The roles and responses. So if you're working on an awareness program, that might be a good, great starting point. We help you understand the incident pattern. Insider and privilege misuse. I use that because it's more prevalent in public sector, right? Time to discover how long did it take in those 12% of our caseload, it took days, weeks, months to detect those. We had to put an average across that caseload to give you a perspective. Time to contain it. Once it was identified, it did take some time to contain that scenario. What was the threat actor? It goes into the tactics and techniques they are using. 
to make them successful. And who are the targeted victims? But ultimately, the countermeasure. So, and for each of this, there is this case file completely described. Each scenario is a few pages. So what happened before Verizon investigative team got there? What did we do? And what were the recommendations we made? Obviously, we had to change uh, in certain data points to hide the, to maintain the anonymity, but it gives you the end-to-end -end perspective of each of the threat scenario. So just for public sector, you can use crimeware and insider privilege misuse, and all of them are documented in the report. It's a huge report, but I just have a few minutes and I just wanted to, to highlight those. But to wrap up, so you can see for each scenario, there's a real example of what happened within that case file. We describe every step of what the threat actor did, what kind of people they focused on, what kind of technology they focused on, what action did they take, it's all laid out for you. Just to wrap up, so for public sector, as you can see, almost over 26% of our caseload was attributed to insider and privilege misuse, right? And these are the threat scenarios. So you can go to these specific numbers in the report and you can see what was happening across those threat scenarios. So it gives you the end-to-end -end perspective. So we started with the journey with 17 international contributors, security incident data. We have the last 10 years of data mapped to the vertical, mapped to the actor, mapped to the action, mapped to the assets, mapped to the attributes, and then we are backing up the, the analysis with the real forensics files and giving, leading you to the critical security controls which you should focus on, or at least consider it as part of your risk, you know, governance risk compliance initiative to make you more impactful. So my goal here is, when I started out, was to provide you an insight into the report, give you the, the, the data breach aspects, the data breach digest, the forensics file, the scenarios from the field, and I've, I've tried to give you enough specific information which you can apply in your own scenario and hopefully it will lead you to take some action. So thank you so much. Um, I don't have much time here, um, I've been told, but I'll be around if you have any questions and, and there's members of the Verizon team as well who would be happy to take on any actions or any, you're looking for any specific information, we can provide that to you. So thank you so much. Have a great conference.